Lonnie Holly, welcome. Thank you very, very much. We're sitting in front of a work of yours, Revelation in the Rock. What am I looking at? You're actually looking at a piece that is representing hard labor. But I, when I chose to work with that shovel, it was like, this has been going on for a long time, laboring hard. And then the rock itself, if you can understand all the engravements in the rock of those that has been buried, and a lot of people didn't get no rock in their honor, a stone in their honor. And when I put that together and saw how hard people had to labor over just certain concepts in order to get them together, it was a wonderful piece to be done. And but the balancing of that were another thing to get it to balance. How did you do that? Actually, we had to move it a couple of different ways and in order to get it to be balanced just right. And that shovel is extremely long. What job does that shovel do in the world? In America, that shovel was for a purpose of removing waste out of something like your separate tanks or back in the day, other kind of waste that human, human waste. And it would shovel it out but he had to reach real far down in the, uh, the ditch or, or, or the trough or the whatever was containing that waste. Did you know when you saw that shovel that it could be something else? I didn't know that it could be this far up the museum ladder, <laughs> but I did know that it had purpose and meaningful uh, identification. Do you remember the first time when you started seeing objects that had been discarded that you wanted to turn into something else or to use? Well, I think I've been doing that pretty well all of my, uh, either one would say, walking from five years old up until now. I was doing my placements with material that I found. And do you remember what it was like in your mind as a child to find things that you wanted to play with or use? Uh, no, it was because there was nobody there for me to explain myself to. But after getting old enough and having someone like William Arnett or the person that came along and took the information that I was giving him about the materials and about the gathering of the materials, about the placement of the materials, or putting these pieces of material together for them to become a piece of art. Uh, it was until then I really un got a better understanding of being an artist. So it took an art professional to tell you that what you were doing was art? Yes, yes, very much so. Uh, because what I had been doing pretty well all of my uh, life were it was not looked at as art. It was looked at as me just moving trash, garbage, and debris around. Instead of me getting celebrated for moving material sources around to tell a story about what their conditions were. What is it about, you use that phrase, trash, garbage, and debris. What is it about those materials that you like what is it about those materials that scare me the most? Not so much of me having to like them, but a world full of uh, discarded material. And this discarded material has become, become a, a moving source by wind, water, and any other way that they are moving because of in the act of deterioration, they don't move but one way. And that's mostly to the water or to the edge. Got the water gonna take them in, take them out, take them in, take them out. It, the, the ocean itself is like a big washing machine to me. It tries to wash up all of our debris. 
and sometimes it just spits it back out because it's too too solid for it to, to, to digest. But at the same time, you take those things and you turn them into things of great beauty, like the piece that we're looking at there, but like all of your other work. Do you understand yet what that transformation is that happens? To some, to some it's beautiful, to some it's ugly. So there is a difference in who is the studiers. And as the studiers study it and grow to understand it, it's not only me, but there was other artists such as myself that was working with these materials, that lived with these materials from the time that they was born up until the time that they passed away or died. So we are actually the person that not only examined it, we were the one that had to understand its way of being used. Was it, well, how important was it to you to have people like Bill Arnett, who was the, the, the first person who um, connected you, I think, with the art world, how important was it for you to be called an artist? I think the importance of being called an artist are, is almost like the importance of saying you are part of our military, you are part of our Navy, you are part of the group that is the salvation of our nation. And then once you get that credit of being an artist and being able to go from there to the Smithsonian and being able to go through all those galleries and seeing all the production of human brains and seeing what can be created, what is possible, what is the possibilities. And then the whole thing is to say, I am capable of doing this. You put this upon yourself. You say, self, I am capable of doing this. I'm not so capable of doing everything everybody do, but I'm capable of doing this. And you keep adding more elements to your art. You added painting quite relatively late in your career, I think. What, what made you start painting as opposed to making the, the creations? The painting compared to some of my structure matter is a lot more simpler for people to have in their homes. <laughs> or to have. It's true, that would be a big shovel in my house. You gotta be a big shovel in your house. It'll be a big shovel in a small institution. Mm. It, it, even that is a big shovel in this institution. <laughs> so you gotta remember how big is big when we are talking about something that is deep. A, a person look at that and say, wow, it took a lot of deep thinking to put that together. So a lot of people didn't give us credit for our thinking ability. Like Thornton Dow, we got an artist in Birmingham, Alabama, his mm -hmm. name is Joe Mentor. Our, our, our Purvis Young, all these other people that was by the water or inland or raised up on the farms, mm -hmm. they actually uh, associated with these materials and they know how to put them together in a very simple manner where a little bit, just a little dab, could do what they wanted them to do. So you say a little dab, but it's not a little dab, is it? Because it's actually something that takes something ordinary and turns it into something extraordinary. I think it takes years. It's a lot of years that comes out of my skills is now getting ready from 1979 until now. You got to think about all the thoughtsmithing that I must have done in order to I like bring. That. It's called thoughtsmithing, mm. but uh, how much thinking on materials that I must have done, and so much that got lost in the in, in my environment in Birmingham, Alabama, that just buried it away, and it didn't get a chance to be seen. Um, talking about Birmingham, Alabama, and the extraordinary story also of your your own life. Of those early memories in that period in the 1950s and early 60s in particular, do you remember adults being cruel to you or kind to you? What, what, what's in your, what are the pictures in your head from that time? I think, I, I'm, excuse me, 
I think there were good people and there were cruel people. But all the people that I kind of had to study was trying to protect something. And the one that actually was cruel to us as children, they didn't see us as children. They saw us as little animals. And so putting us away or getting us out of sight, like Alabama Industrial School for Negro Children, that I was put into the slave camp at 11 years old, they didn't see us as children. You see what I'm talking about? And especially me that had grew up around the Alabama State Fairground and, and every, from one and a half until I turned 11, how much I had seen with a drive-in theater, a half a block in the back of me, how much I had seen and a, and a, and a racetrack how much I had seen uh, in a what, the Constantine restaurant, how I, I had seen people rushing to be fed, rushing to have a little shot after they have a tired day. All of this kind of stuff affiliated with the art uh, of what I've been doing. Do you remember being hungry as a child? Many times, many times. Am I right that the, the woman who took you in, you, you were malnourished when she took you in? Many times. Don't forget that. I, I can't, I try not to. My thoughts, I call it an ocean of thoughts. So when I dive in thought, uh, some I try to uh, limit myself from having to think, mm -hmm. but the most violent thoughts of mine were about me being hungry. And that time for any child is a, is a wicked, horrible time. You had a toy, a single toy, I think, a wagon, is that right? You studied me well. I did have my little red wagon. And after I got hit by the car and drug up underneath that car for two and a half blocks and stayed unconscious for three and a half months, I never did see my wagon again. I, I did a, little, a piece of art out of an old wagon that I found and a block of wood because I was going across the street to collect some wood for a fire. Mm -hmm. And I asked the question, where did my little wagon go? All the things that mattered to me in my life, it was almost taken away. And I didn't know that I was being fashion. I like the word fashion. Brain fashioned it for to be the artist that I am. It's, it makes me think of something that Jane Fonda said, who's one of your mentors, I think, in a way. And she asked you the question, why did you thrive? Why was your brain fashioned to, to enable you to survive when so many people who had a similar story to yours with hunger, with hatred, being put away, a chaotic childhood, they didn't thrive? How were you able to thrive? I think one thing were that I was kept away from uh, what was even more harmful for me. I was up and down the ditches and the creeks. And from that, from the ditches, I could go in the ditch anytime I got ready. Well, not anytime, because Mr. McElroy said, get your ass out of this house. You ain't gonna sit here and listen at the adults. Get out of here and go dig them worms. Digging those worms, corralling those crawfish, looking at those minnows and playing with those pieces of broken glass and broken uh, uh, material actually shaped me. Which brings me to your hands. It's the thing that, one of the first things you notice about you is all of your jewelry and it's the thing that stays in your head. When I watched you perform the other day, when you put your hand up, you see all of your jewelry. Tell me, show me your it's hands. It's on my left hand. It's just one hand. Yeah, I didn't because realize that. Because on my left hand, when I'm gripping something, you don't see no calluses in my hand. You see? Yeah. So when I grip it, and then with my right hand, I'm cutting. I don't cut myself. You see what I'm talking about? So when you're working with materials. Yeah, when I'm working with material, this hand actually is like having some protective 
material on it to keep you from wounding yourself. But a lot of people, you know, and, and, it's, and, 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 and the rings and things that I wear, they have some values to them also, personal value. But it's like your artistic chain mail. It's artistic in a sense. It, it to helps protect me, you. protects my, this hand, because it's got to have that grip. Mm. Whatever I'm doing, got to have that grip. Now, no, no matter whether I'm bending or I'm, I'm, I'm untying, See, I have to, I, I even, I, I carry something with me. You can see how I wear this screen. I wear it in the airport. So if I needed a piece of it, <laughs> I got it long enough that I can take me a little pair of clippers and cut it off, and I got some screens to tie. So I'm always taking stuff with me. I got a screen here if I needed to take it off. You see what I'm talking about? So hidden to the uh, person that actually see me, I got hidden qualities about me. And are you always doing it? So you take that with you, but is there any time in your life when you're not looking to make something? Is it always there, the compulsion? Now, now the compulsion that you just say, I haven't been using that word, but the compulsion to use my brain, I'm so thankful that it's still capable of being used. After all that I went through, after all the beating and being knocked upside the head by grown people, I've been knocked out maybe at least 10 times. More times than Muhammad Ali. Unconscious. Mm. But I'm still, actually I'm getting ready to my next birthday, I'll be 74. And I'm proud of being able to get to this age and still can work hard. You also added music to your repertoire, and we heard you perform the other night. It lifted, lifted the roof off the art gallery. You, you, I think you call it, it is, a lot of it is improvisation. Why do you improvise? I didn't know I was lifting the roof off the play. You were. But you say. I say. Therefore it is. Therefore it then is. And done. And done. But, uh, but again, I come with nothing but the truth. I try to bring the truth about life. How life is, uh, I, it's like, I want to be ready, I want to be ready. Not to walk in Jerusalem, not to walk in Jerusalem. This is not Jerusalem. I want to walk upon this planet. Hmm? I want to be ready to walk upon this planet no matter what the conditions of it is. And we're gonna have to learn to do that as hum the humanities of the universe. We're gonna have to learn to deal with our planet no matter what condition that we have to live with. Lonnie Holly, it's an honor to spend a little time on this planet with you. Thank you. Thank you.